to any first time visitors. We have a visitor's card on our bulletin. If there's any first time visitors with us, uh, take a look at the flap. Got a couple things here. Uh, one, Marie Edelman, who is, um, of course, Anita's sister, wants to thank us. Uh, Pam sent some pictures down from the service and uh, she called her and said she thanks everybody at church for all their support and uh, just continue to pray for her. And of course, it's not over for her, right? You have the house and you have the, you know, the will and you know, this thing goes, well, Paul, you know, right? <laughs> this thing goes on and on and on, you know. Well, yeah, she's in Louisiana, and if you pay the lawyer to do all this, that's very, very expensive. Um, not a discount rate. Yeah, so I mean, so just be in prayer that all that will, you know, be taken care of. We have communion next Sunday, so take note of that. Uh, Sue Pfaff will be here on the 14th to give an update on the return to Papua New Guinea after the death of her you know, husband, Jerry. And so that, that should be pretty exciting. Uh, there'll be a board meeting on August the 26th at 6 p.m. That's a, uh, a uh, Friday. Uh, and, and food will be provided. Yeah, six o'clock, yeah, food will be provided there. So we're, we're good. So uh, we're having a dinner and a meeting on the uh, That's right, that's right. The, 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 that's, that's the meetings of the Zerk. <laughs>
some of the people that were in the church almost were nastier than some of the people who were outside. I said, wait a minute, what, what, what's going on here? Not everybody who comes to church is a spiritual believer. <laughs> and Satan's going to put some of his uh, worst people uh, within the church to devour the flock. And Paul warns of that. He warns it in 1 Corinthians. He warns it in 2 Corinthians. Uh, the last epistles written in the scriptures, all of them were warning about that. 2 Peter, uh, Jude, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, all those were warning about the fact that you have to stay on guard you know, and that's, that's one of the scenarios I had in the, the novel that I finished was the fact that this young man who finally came to Christ, not going to Christian college, he would have no temptation, no problems. Ha! Huh. <laughs> Does not work that way. There is no place in this world where you're totally secure from temptation or worldly people. There just isn't any. And so Paul is warning there and Paul is warning Timothy. Now remember, I was thinking about this yesterday. Timothy is of a totally different nature than Paul. Paul was very direct, right, very bold. Timothy was a little bit softer in nature. Paul is trying to encourage him. Uh, you know, I've said this before, and it's shocked people, but I, I really believe it. I think Paul would have been a lousy pastor. <laughs> he was just too blunt. <laughs> he was just too direct. He was a great evangelist, a great church planter. Exactly. But Timothy had more of the shepherd's heart, but he didn't have quite the strength or boldness. And so there's, there's this issues that... Uh, you know, each one of these men were dealing with. So Paul says, now Paul is stating, and I think one of the reasons why he states it this way, is he's telling Timothy, when you need to be bold, right, you need to really step up and say things plainly and directly. Timothy probably tried to, you know, softly said, no, there's times where you have to say, okay, no, this is it. We're not allowing this here. Notice what he says here, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise, in other words, what I just taught you, and does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which comes envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain for such withdraw yourself. Now, you really didn't want to deal with these type of people within the body of Christ, right? But that's where reality, there's three things I think that shocked me when I first became a pastor. Number one, how much interface you had to do with the government. I just thought, you got to be kidding. I didn't go. They didn't teach me anything about that in seminary. All the details. Number three, handling different personalities. Number two, handling different personalities. And number three, always happened to be on guard of someone coming in to bring error and, and, and disruption in the church, and it, it's just a constant. I just wanted to preach and teach and, you know, be in, uh, involved and growing the ministry, but the, all these struggles and impediments are there. And so, so Paul is warning Timothy that there's going to be dissenters in the church. Now, Paul gives Timothy the measuring stick of a true, dis, true disciples. He says, listen, a true disciple will accept the teachings that I'm teaching you. That's what he said. Listen, if it, listen, the word of God's foundational, right? He said, oh, accept it. Now, this acceptance comes in, in, in three levels. Number one, you accept what's being taught. How much of what's being taught? Uh, yeah, exactly. You can't pick and choose, right? 
Secondly, that you embrace what's being taught. Not only do you accept that it's being true, but you're going to live by it. And number three, you're going to be able to pass that on to other people, right? Because if others are not following that, you want to encourage them to do that. And remember, guarding the church is a responsibility of not just a pastor and the board, but what? All of us, right? We, 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 we watch out for those things that would come in and to disrupt. And so Paul gives, he said, listen, they have to accept what we're teaching here. Secondly, there are those, uh, there are many who profess believers who do not submit to biblical teaching. I mean, I've heard over the years people say, yeah, I know that's what it says, but I can't live that way. Well, wait a minute. First of all, God would not have commanded it unless you could obey it. <laughs> And secondly, he doesn't give you an option, right? He doesn't say, well, if you want to obey that, that's, that, that's fine. If not, it's just an option. No, no, no. He, he says, this is what I'm teaching, and this is the way it is. And if you have a different opinion, guess who's wrong, right? And so, so he said, listen, you can't allow this. You can't. And I found out very early on in the, in the pastorate, you can't ignore it either. Oh, it'll go away. No, it doesn't go away. It just what? Festers. You know the old saying that one bad apple, what? Ruins the whole bush. So if you just leave it in there, right, it will make everything else rotten in there as well. And uh, and the Lord loved to use the illustration about yeast. If you were just a little bit of yeast, that's what? Permeates everything. That's what sin does, just permeates everything. And so he's warning Timothy about these things. Now, I, would note, I want you to notice very clearly here that Paul does not evaluate whether these dissenters are saved or not. Because there are carnal Christians that are saved but still aren't following and still aren't growing and things like that. So he's not saying that all these are unsaved. It doesn't say that. But he does have a whole list of things he does say about them. He's just, allow, he's just going to allow the Lord to decide whether these are true believers or just infant believers, uh, rebellious believers, or, if they're un, or they're false believers. And they're all mixed in. And what, by the way, we can't, we can't make those judges say, oh, this guy can't be a Christian. Well... Don't know. I mean, that's up to the Lord, right? But he's not surely a obedient Christian, <laughs> you know, if he's doing these things. And so he doesn't evaluate. There are those who are immature, who have grown little, and there are false brethren. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the list in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where he's listening to all the problems he went through. You know, he's, he was beaten with rods three times. He was scourged five times. He was, he was stoned and left for dead once. He was, you know, he was a shipwreck. And he said, besides that, to carry the church. And then in verse 26, 11, 26, he says, in false brethren. <laughs> I mean, there were people who got close to Paul, then he turned around and later on found out that they weren't real true believers. They did a lot of damage. Alexander the Coppersmith, uh, uh, Philemus, uh, uh, Hiramus, uh, and, uh, you know, Demas. He said they're false brethren for whatever reason, profane, you know, proclaimed Christ, but really were not true believers. And so he mentions this here, he says, there are all those. Now, the dissenters, have said, he says, they will not submit the wholesome words. The word wholesome there is actually a medical term. It means healthy. Matter of fact, you can write this down. This is kind of neat. This Greek word is what we get our word hygiene from. You're supposed to go, ooh. Anyway, so that thing I need, ah. So the word hygiene comes from this Greek word. And he's not talking, obviously, about physical health, but about what? About spiritual health. He says, when you're having the word of God being taught, that is for your spiritual health, right? Those who reject that reject health for themselves. 
And so he says that these are healthy words. It's used metaphorically here. The teachings that lead to spiritual vitality. He says, and since they reject that, they teach unhealthy things. Uh, false doctrines and ignorance in, in, in the assembly. And, and they stir up strife. By the way, every single one, 100% of the time, <clears throat> people who do not follow the word of God stir up problems in the Thing. They, they tear people down, they say false things, they spectre things that are unsound uh, and true, and they, they stir up problems. And, and, and who, who are the ones that are the greatest hit? Well, yeah, right, the weaker ones. The ones who don't quite know, you know, what it is, uh, discerning, and what this guy says sounds good, and and the weaker ones are the ones who get trampled, don't they? Matter of fact, I've been in areas where, you know, there'd be kind of church splits and stuff like that. And most of the time, the weaker ones never come back. Not only to our church, but to any church. They are driven away. And that's the description you have in, Isaiah, in Jer- I think it's Jeremiah 29, where, where the shepherds are the ones that scattered the sheep. And so the shepherds are supposed to do what? They're supposed to take care of the sheep and watch over the sheep and, and, and nourish the sheep. And so, so he says, so you've got to be careful. They stir up problems. They reject godly teachings that lead to spiritual growth. They're rebels. Now, let me mention this. I've mentioned this a number of times. You can't force someone to grow, Right? You really can't force someone to accept the word of God. You can't force them to reject their sin, right? You can't force them to live a godly lifestyle. They might claim to be believers, but they refuse to grow. You know, and we have this all the way through scriptures where, you know, Moses was frustrated with Israel, right? And Joshua was frustrated with them. And, and then all the prophets, Ezekiel and Hosea and Amos, all oh, frustrated. And then when you get to the New Testament, the Lord stops and turns to his disciples and says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I tell you to do? I mean, if I'm a Lord, I'm supposed to be what? I'm supposed to be obeyed, right? And, and so then, then Paul has to deal with the, the Corinthians, and he had to deal with old foolish Galatians. He has to deal with all these people that say, you say you love the Lord, but you're not following through. Okay, and so, so you can't force someone to grow. You can't be the Holy Spirit for them, and you have to let the Lord handle it. There's only three things you can do. Number one, you can pray for them, right? Number two, you can be an example to them, and number three, you can challenge them to follow what they're supposed to do. But, but you can't force them to do it. Now, notice what he says, those who don't follow sound doctrine. Now, doctrine sounds like a fancy technical term. All it means is teachings. The Greek word is didasko. All it means is, is, is to, to, to be taught. True doctrine has three qualities. Number one, I want you to notice what he says. First of all, it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. All the word of God comes down from Jesus Christ. He said, this is what the Lord has sanctioned. This is what the Lord has you know, trying to teach, and so it's from Jesus Christ. So when you read the Word of God, we come from Jesus Christ, give them to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit moved the prophets and the apostles to write these things down, and so whenever you read this, this is an epistle from God to you, okay? This is from the Lord. Secondly, not only is it from the Lord, secondly, the words lead to spiritual growth. This is your manual to tell you what to believe and how to grow. This is your manual. This is your owner's manual. You know, when, whenever you get a car, it comes with an owner's manual with 10,000 things you can't do. I remember when we got a Honda one time, it says, don't go over big bumps. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Hello, uh, you know, when you're driving on the road, you're going to hit some big bumps. I mean, do you think, what's that? does that get rid of your warranty <laughs> when you go over big bumps, you know? So, uh, so I made sure that we only went over small ones, right? 
<laughs> and so, uh, so it tells you how to grow spiritually. So it's from Christ. And it teaches us, thirdly, it teaches us how to be godly. You know, you have, you have three basic things when you come to Christ. Number one, salvation. Amen. Amen. Number two, you have teaching which tells you what is true and not true. And number three, you have teaching that tells you how to live godly. How to be moral, right? How, I mean, what your speech should be like and what, you know, what your actions should be like. And it has to deal with kindness and has to deal with righteousness, right, and holiness. It has to deal with all these things. And so the word of God is complete for that. By the way, there's nothing missing. Now, there's a lot of things we'd like to know that we don't know. But everything we need to know is here. Right, everything we need to know. This is, by the way, I think we have enough problems finding what we need to know than worrying about what we don't know and what hasn't been told to us. And so the doctrine is the sole guide for faith. By the way, I've, I've always been grateful that the Word of God is a book you can pick up and read and handle. It's not a three... 30 volume set of encyclopedias. It gave us just what we need to know. We don't have this enormous thing. No one can say that the Word of God is overwhelming. It's just the right size for us. And so everything we need to know is there. Now, then he goes and he talks about the dissenters, the disputers. Uh, he says they're motivated by the flesh, they refuse to submit to any authority but their own. They refuse, they, they want to be in charge. And we have this, you know, for example, Jesus tells the parable about the king that goes away for a while, you know, to a land he's going to come back, and then the people send a note to, we're not going to have this man rule over us. And they refuse, they want to be their own kings and their own bosses, and so they refuse to submit to the authority. Secondly, they love arguing and self-promotion. And this really causes problems in the body of Christ. They love to argue. They love to dispute. They love to use rhetoric. They love, they love to use philosophy. And they love to overwhelm. And that's self-promoting. They think they have special knowledge. Have, have you ever run across people who think they have special knowledge? Think they, oh, you know, the Lord told me this. And, Oh, really? I remember we had someone here a number of years ago. The, the Lord told me by Tuesday I'm going to get this government job. I said, oh, really? He did. So the next time he said, to get the government job? Oh, no, but I'm going to get it. I said, wait, wait a minute. You said the Lord told you what? By Tuesday, you're going to get this job. Well, you didn't. Well, they just moved right on. You know, to me, I would be scared to death. Deuteronomy 18 says, listen, if a prophet says they're speaking for me and they speak a prophecy and doesn't come true, they're what? False prophet. That's right. You, 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 you get rid of them. <laughs> you whack them off because, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not from me. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people out there who claim to be apostles, or claim to be prophets, or claim to be have some special revelation from God, or some kind of discernment, or some, and, and they're they're out there, and they say all kinds of things, and you say, uh, don't think so. I'm going to stay with the Word of God, but they all, but they come into the church and they try to to impose this stuff. Now, notice what he says about them. He says, first of all, they're prideful. Their number one trait is pride. The word here is high-minded, translated in most scriptures. The little Greek word means they're wrapped around in smoke. I said, what? They're wrapped around in smoke. In other words, in other words, this conceit is the fact that they're just totally covered with, with confusion and, and, and so hidden you know, what they really are. They're covered with smoke. And so uh, we have a saying, right? He says, that guy's just blowing smoke. <laughs> you know, you know th there's nothing to it. And that's exactly what prideful people do. They just blow smoke. <laughs> there's nothing real in them. 
And so they're high-minded, literally means it blow, you know, wrapped in smoke, they're conceited. They think very highly of themselves, you know. Have you met people who thought very highly of themselves? <laughs> that person really thinks very highly of themselves, <laughs> you know. Other people don't think so highly of that person, but, but they really think highly of themselves. Uh, they're too arrogant to be humble. Uh, they uh, have a foundation of, of sin. As a matter of fact, pride is a foundation of just about all sin. And he says, so these guys are prideful. Secondly, they don't know anything. Uh, we, you know, we talk about people who are know-nothings. Do a lot of talking, <laughs> but they really don't know anything. And so these know-nothings, they understand nothing, they really think, matter of fact, we have a saying also, a little bit of knowledge is what? Dangerous thing. And some they have a little bit of scripture, but then they think they know everything and they spout all kinds of things and in confusion you go, huh? What is this guy talking about? You know, and yet they 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 say it as if it was absolutely true, certain, and you say this guy doesn't know anything. He's a no no. They don't understand anything. Then he says they're obsessed with disputes and arguments. One of the things, you know, we're going to uh, see at the end of the chapter where he said, listen, just avoid foolish strife. You can't talk sense to these guys. You ever try to argue with a cultist? You know, it's just, you know, you can't, they won't listen to reason. They won't listen. They won't stop to look at evidence. And uh, that's why in the political world, you have a lot of shouting, a lot of name calling, stuff like that, but they won't sit down and go through evidence because they can't. They can't, they, they can't talk on that level because they don't have it. And so this type of person obsessed with arguing, uh, matter of fact, the literal word here means they, they're morbidly, morbidly afflicted with striving and argument over words. Literally, word battles. That's a, that, that it's, this word is made up of two Greek words, word battles. <laughs> and they want to get you in a what? An argument, right? They want to get, they want, and they, they're just spouting off and trying to promote, you know, all, all the stuff that they think and everything else, and they're the authority, and no one else has seen this insight before. And, and uh, he said, it says, you know, that's what these guys are. And they come to church and try to, get people on their side, and, and they actually feel justified if they can get a lot of people to follow them, right? And they cause problems. And so they're, they're doing these word battles, and it's due to their pride, because they want to compete for the preeminence, we have that over in Third John with Diotrephes, uh, they're full of envy, they're full of strife, they're full of jealousy, and they blaspheme God with their errors. You know, one of the most dangerous things that a person can do is claim to speak for God when they don't. <laughs> and they're so full of pride that they just bypass the Word of God. Matter of fact, most of them are too lazy to study the Word of God. And they grab a hold of a few concepts and then they go off and promote this stuff. And I've often said that I don't care what the heresy is, uh, somebody out there believes it. <laughs> you can come up with the most ridiculous things in your life. Somebody believes it. There's somebody has a cult built around it. I, you know, one of the most tedious things in seminary had to do is go through all these early heresies and they say, this guy believes what? And just go on to these writings of, you know, of these uh, heretics, the Montanus, the Docetus, the Pelagians, the Sibelians. Forget, you don't need to know any of those. You know. I have a book that is just a summary of these heresies, and it's 800 pages long, and that's just the summary. You know. A brief, concise history of it. Oh, my. You know. I'd like to see the exhaustive, you know, history of these things. But they're all, there's, I don't care what the heresy is, somebody out there believes it. And then they arouse evil suspicions. And, this, and I, this, is, this is one of the most devastating parts, is the fact they cause 
the believers to doubt. And they sow doubt and confusion because most people who go to church, they're not seminarians. They're not, they're not studying the Word of God you know, based upon an analytical, diacritical way. They, 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 that's not where we live. And they had these guys come up with this, this, this absolute nonsense. And, and when they come up with this absolute nonsense, and then they get people to doubt. And, uh, you know, the Lord says, you better be careful if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me. It'd be better if you'd never been born, that you put a millstone around your neck and jump into the sea because, you know, you, you, you caused them to go off. And, and the more you cause to go off, the deeper your sin and the deeper your judgment. But they cause, it says here, literally evil suspicions. And, and one of the reasons they do this is because they come across confident, right? And arrogant and bold, and this is the absolute truth, and they have all these reasons why they believe this, and it's all made up in a bunch of nonsense. You know, there's a saying I like to, to continually use, you know, you know, bad premises lead to wrong conclusions. <laughs> If you start out wrong, you're going to what? End up wrong. I remember, uh, remember, no, you don't. You're not, you're not young enough. I mean, old enough. Back in the early launches, you know, I, back, in the early, back in the days of Mercury and Gemini, the television had been all day long waiting for this launch to go off, and they'd explain things. And I remember one scientist stand up, I was a kid, and one scientist would stand up and said, Listen, if we're off a quarter percent at launch, we'll miss the moon by 40,000 miles. Just by being off a slightly. Well, that's what error is, right? If you're off just a little bit, it continues to what? The veer off course. And so they are corrupted. They so doubt about sound teaching and by the way, um, you can't argue with these people. It's best to say, well, I don't know the stuff you're talking about. I know what I believe from Scripture and try to avoid them. They try to corner you. They're obsessed with that. The more people they can get to believe what they're saying, the more puffed up they are, see. And so they seek to do this. They are corrupt. They love disputes. They have these vain philosophy of attainment. And notice what it says, that they think that the gospel is a way to make gain, to get rich. If they get a lot of people supporting them and everything else. Now, let me tell you a story. This was told to me years ago. This is in, in, the, in the black church area where this uh, godly pastor, he drove up in a car, a late model car, at this conference, and some of his fellow seminarians went to school, drove up with chauffeur limousines. And they got out, and they came over and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He says, you know, you're not doing this right. And they're telling him how he could, you know, get rich through the gospel. He said, well, I thought our goal was to serve people in the gospel and everything else. But to those men, it was a matter of, you know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the king, you know, I'm the thing, you know, you need to support the, you need to support the man of God. And, and they, they had riches, and I see it over again. I remember one time where he had a funeral rental, just several years ago. And they asked, well, where's the pastor's chair? So I mean, I just sit in a normal chair. Oh, oh no, no, special chair, a throne. This is the pastor. And then my wife was told one time we had a meeting, there had to be a special chair for the first lady. You know, a special place, you know. You know, and one time we had a, one time we had a repairman come over, the uh, old uh, fuse box lit on fire, which wasn't a good idea, had a loon and feet in, you know. And uh, so he was out changing, and he said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. He said, 
I just came from a pastor's house. He has, uh, I think it's 12 acres. He has an airstrip. He has a, and everything else. It is. I said, oh, no, 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 that's, <laughs> that's not what we do. <laughs> so, matter of fact, I even once, listen to this. I even, we were passing out literature for vacation Bible school to the neighborhood. I introduced myself to pastors. Oh, no, no, pastors don't do that. You, you, let, you let the people go out there. Pastors don't do that. God. No, no, what are you talking about? We're serving what? Yeah, together, right? And so we get it. So these people think that the gospel is a way to get rich. And so they seek that. He said, now, now I notice what, notice what he says, how he ends. He says, I want you to avoid such people. You need to give them a wide berth. And if they cause trouble, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, you have to deal with them can't allow that to happen. And if people coming up there trying to give you some kind of cultish thing, avoid them. And here's what they always do. I mean, almost all the time. We're the only ones that have the truth. We have this, you believe this, and this, and this, had the truth. And you can't get to heaven unless you believe the way we do. Show me that in Scripture. He said, I want you to avoid them. Matter of fact, it says, or to, he told the Romans the same thing. Romans chapter 6, he said, listen, mark those who cause problems and avoid them. <laughs> and so we need to be on guard. You need to know what you believe, right? You need to know why you believe it. And you need to stand firm. Not all your questions are going to be answered. But if you're walking with the Lord, the Spirit will say, watch out, right? The Spirit will tell you, watch out. This person is telling you something that's off. And by the way, quite often they have part of it right, and they're just, a little, that's all it takes. A little bit off, they add something to it. Or they take something off. And so when we come to a point of understanding, Paul is warning, said, listen, avoid these people. And in the body of Christ, deal with them. Because they're going to be everywhere. They're going to grow. You're not going to avoid them until the Lord comes back. And one of the things that you are going to be judged on is how well you stood for the word of God, for the scriptures, following the teachings the Lord gave, and it says, given an answer for the hope that lies in you. Amen? And the redeemed of the Lord needs to say so. And stand firm. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for what uh, you've taught Timothy here. And we need to stand firm in the word of God. We need to stand firm that we'll be able to do those things that are proper and, and believe those things that are right. And Lord, just bless your people here. And Lord, guard us against such errors coming in, Lord. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. At the end of uh, each service, I'd like to give a little uh, gospel outline. We never assume that uh, everyone here or everyone looking on YouTube is in Christ. Even if you were in church all your life, that doesn't save you. And so... We have uh, three points. Number one, this man over here represents all mankind. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we can't get to heaven over here where God is because it says evil can't dwell with God. And period. Sin's evil. So this lake of fire, we're made in the image of God and have eternal souls. And this lake of fire is prepared for those who can't enter heaven. Revelation 20. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A bridge is spread across there, and that's Jesus Christ. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. If you never put your faith in Jesus Christ, we would invite you to do so this morning.